Whether you're a brand new course creator or you've had lots of success in selling online courses already, this episode has something for you. I'm chatting with Mara Kusarek about all things online courses. Mara is an online course designer, launch strategist, and the host of the Create a Better Course podcast, and she's helped over 150 entrepreneurs launch online courses and digital products. She lives in Tampa, Florida with her husband, two dogs, and her brand new baby girl. And I've known Mara online for quite a few years now, actually, because she's a longtime listener of this podcast. And ironically, she's actually been in both of my courses and even my website template course because she's a website template customer as well. So we've had a lot of overlap in that area. And guys, Mara really knows all the things about creating quality courses that give your students wins and help you ultimately grow your business. And I actually learned a lot from this interview as someone who's made courses already and has had success with online courses. And so I know for you, regardless of where you are in your like course stage of your business, you'll get a lot from as well. So we talk about things like, are courses oversaturated? Are there too many? Is there room for yours? We talk about online course trends for 2024, how to help people actually finish your course so it just does not just collect dust on their course shelf. We talk about launch strategies for online courses and evergreen versus live launching and kind of the difference and how to evaluate which one's right for you. We talk about how to turn around a failed launch, what to do and what not to do when you're kind of feeling like things are just not working. Refund policies for online courses, which is something people do not talk about enough, but we cover. And then we talk about common mistakes people make when selling their courses and so much more. And we really do just do like a true, like deep dive into everything courses in 2024. So you are going to love this one. Uh, Again, I certainly did. Here's my conversation with Mara. Hey guys, I'm Elizabeth McCravey, an online educator for entrepreneurs, website designer, wife, boy mom, and your host for the Breakthrough Brand Podcast, the show that's all about pulling back the curtain on how to actually build a successful business. I don't skim the surface around here. If you want to dive deep into the nitty gritty details of what it takes to run a sustainable business that fits your unique lifestyle while standing out in a crowd, then you are in the right place. I created a multiple six figure a year business in my early twenties. And now in my thirties, I'm still running that successful multiple six figure a year business on just part-time hours now as a working mom. I'm here to share everything I've learned and everything I'm still learning because I believe that the keys to building a thriving business should never be a secret. Here you'll find episodes that are actionable, direct, and fun, like friends chatting business over coffee and a fresh, honest take on the reality of being an entrepreneur. If you're ready to master online marketing, website design, personal branding, mindset, time management as a busy parent, scalable and passive income, and business strategy, then this is the podcast for you. It's time to build your breakthrough brand. Let's do this. All right, guys, if you are interested in course creation, whether you like have already made lots of money in courses and had tons of students, or if you're like making your first course, you will get so much from this episode. I'm so excited. Mara is like a course genius, literally. So welcome to the podcast, Mara. Excited to chat with you. I'm so excited to be here. I don't know if you know this, Elizabeth, but I'm like one of, I think, your OG podcast listeners. I randomly (laughs) found it on Google and I think you were like four episodes in and I've been hooked ever since. I didn't know you found it from Google. I love hearing that. That's really fun. I did because I have a bunch of clients who are on WordPress and it's like the bane of their existence because WordPress is really hard to update if you don't know what you're doing. And so I was looking for a solution of how they could all stop going crazy. And then I found you and then I found Show It and your templates and I've been recommending them ever since and like making a bunch of people's lives easier when I'm like, if you don't like WordPress, you do not have to fully be on WordPress. Yeah. So thank you for that. And you're in Booked Out Designer and Podcast Success Blueprint. So we have all the things. And I listen to your podcast, which we'll talk about. So super fun connections there. Yeah. Tell everyone though, who you are, what you do and like how you help people in your business. 
My name is Mara Kasarik. I'm a wife. I'm a mom to a four-month-old baby who just learned how to roll over recently, which is super fun and a little chaotic because now she like rolls under the couch when she's on the floor playing and you have to really keep an eye on oh, her. Gosh. I live in Tampa, Florida, and pretty much my entire world is online courses. I worked in corporate marketing for a long time and I did instructional design. Which if people don't know, instructional design is like the fancy corporate term that they use for designing online courses. So I did that for a long time. I was a middle school English teacher, and then I started my own business doing all of that stuff, but for entrepreneurs. So I help small business owners and entrepreneurs set up and launch profitable online courses. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize you did that as a corporate type career first. That's really cool. I did. And it's so interesting because so many corporations need some sort of course. Usually it's for like their Mm -hmm. employees. Like Marriott has a million things they need to train their employees how to do. So they bring in someone to design a course. So I did that for a really long time. And then I realized, wait, I can work with like way more fun businesses and still be doing the same thing. And there's a lot more freedom too in the entrepreneurial world. Like your course can be so much more interesting than in the corporate world. It's pretty cut and dry. It's like the boring mm-hmm. training videos that you have to watch when you have a job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's awesome that you have that experience. And like, I know from you being in my courses, you've helped me through like random times I've asked you for feedback and you've been like, oh, this would be a good idea. And I'm like, this, that would be a good idea. Thank you. So you just have so much ideas out there. But first, let's talk about I guess you could say like an elephant in the room of like, if people say it's about podcasting too and all the things, but like with courses specifically, I've heard people say nobody buys courses anymore or the market's too saturated. I've even felt that at times when we look at people who are teaching how to make an online course. And there's so many people teaching that. And it's like, everyone can make one quick money, go make a course. And then it's like, is it becoming oversaturated because of that? Yeah, I just love your thoughts on that. So it's absolutely true that there are way more online courses out there than there were five years ago. When I left my traditional nine to five job to do this, it wasn't that common that people had a course. Like I would tell people, oh, we set up courses for people. And like the average person would be like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what you're talking about. In like the launch materials for courses, we used to have to explain what an online course was because it sounded kind of sketchy like five years ago of, you're going to buy this thing, you're going to give me this money. And then there's going to be these videos like people didn't know how that works. You no longer have to explain that to people. People know what online courses are. I think in general, like buyers understand it a lot more. So you don't have to sell yourself in that way where you're explaining what it is, you're explaining the benefit, like really, you're just selling them on the results that your course is going to have. Also, you can get way more specific about your niche right now. When I think of like, three years ago, if you wanted to create a course, there was a lot more of your course has to be super long. It has to cover like every single thing about email marketing, which is enormous. I don't know how anyone could ever make a course that truly covered everything about email marketing. But now you could make a course that's about something more like, how do you make fun custom GIFs in your email? And like, Mm -hmm. that's something I personally want to know. So I think it's really cool that people are creating cooler courses now, like much more interesting courses. So is the market saturated? Yes. But with saturation comes a lot of opportunities. It's also so much easier to make a course nowadays. Like the advancements in software and technology is so much better. You don't have to like be piecing together a bunch of things. I always tell people it's kind of like if you were a doctor or a lawyer, no one would ever tell you, you can't do that. People are already doing that. There's enough of them. I don't know why in the online course world, we do this weird thing where we're like, oh, that person has a course that's kind of related to what I want to do. So I'm not allowed to do it. Like if we did, if any other profession did that, we would say that's crazy, but we do it in the online course world. So there's space for so many people out there. Yeah, I love what you just said, because like, first of all, there's no way like you'll do it differently than however that person has done it when it comes to that mindset of like, well, someone has a similar course on that idea. So I love that. And you're right, it's so much easier to make and sell a course than it used to be. Like I've heard like OG course people talk about mailing CDs to people physically in the mail. It's like we don't with love with videos on that you put in your like TV or in your computer. It's like, yeah, we don't have to do that anymore. We have great softwares and things that help us. So Yeah, that's a really awesome perspective. I'd love to hear too, 
thinking about this year, 2024, and as someone who's been in courses for a while, what are some like course trends that you're seeing? Interrupting this episode with a suggestion for the small business owners listening. Ever wonder what you should do for healthcare when you and your spouse are both self-employed so there's no work-provided health insurance to participate in? Well, when my husband Adam joined me in the entrepreneurial job space over four years ago, we joined Christian Healthcare Ministries instead of getting traditional health insurance. And it was the best decision for us, especially in these years of growing and raising a family while also running multiple businesses. CHM is a health cost sharing ministry and is a faith-based alternative to health insurance. We did tons of research before choosing CHM. And if you know me and Adam, you know, we are all about doing the math when making big or small financial decisions. And even though it's not insurance, CHM shares 100% of eligible medical bills, which is more than the typical 70 or 80% of medical bills paid for by insurance companies. All sharing is determined by the CHM guidelines, which you can check out before and after joining. And for the mamas and mamas to be listening, you truly cannot find a better healthcare option for maternity care. I had a vaginal delivery and a C-section and birth center care and hospital care between my two pregnancies and births, and it was all 100% shared for. And outside of birth, we've had our share of emergency room visits and procedures as a family, and those costs were all shared by members at Christian Healthcare Ministries, leaving us only paying our monthly contribution. CHM is less expensive month-to-month than insurance, and because there's no network, you can choose your care with whichever providers best fit your family. I seriously just cannot recommend Christian Healthcare Ministries enough. You've got to check them out. Go to elizabethmccravey.com slash CHM for more information. Also putting that link in the show notes, Elizabeth with McCravey.com slash CHM. Now back to the episode. I'm such a nerd about this stuff. I had a business friend who was making fun of me about my spreadsheet because I'll like track different launch results and then things I see people doing. I also am always talking to other business owners and I'm like, what's working in your business? What's not working? But in general, I think a big one in 2024 is everything is shorter. Like we seem to all not have as much of an attention span or maybe we're just all busier. I don't know exactly what it is, but something I've been seeing a trend of is one shorter (laughs) launches. So like it used to be like a 10 day launch was really normal a while ago. And then I would say for the last couple of years, like a seven day launch was pretty typical. And now I'm seeing like three to four day launches. Sometimes even a 48 hour launch performs a lot better than doing that like really big launch where people forget what you're talking about and you're adding a bonus every day. And then on the flip Mm -hmm. side of that, shorter courses too, like getting to the point because people want the shortcut. When you create a course, it feels like you should put everything in the course, like literally everything. And that honestly overwhelms people. And most people, if you have a course, probably at some point people have told you, this looks amazing, but I don't have time to take it. So like you need to address that objection head on of this is going to be to the point and everything in here is going to be so helpful that you will make time to take it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And with, okay, I have a few follow-up questions for you. First of all, I've also noticed a lot of those trends. And also the shorter launch period. 10-day launches are painful as a business owner too. Like exhausting, I think, and exhausting for your customers and potential customers. But I did for Podcast Success Blueprint a four-day launch for the beta, then a five-day for the second opening. And that's why I've tended towards five-day as first. But I liked the four-day for that. So I agree with that. One question though, when you mentioned like a 48-hour launch period, When you're advising someone who's doing that, would you tell them to let people in after who missed it? Like say they get an email the next day and they're like, oh my gosh, I I was so excited, but I didn't check my email for two days. Like what would you do with that? So I'm glad you're asking this because most people do not think this through and you kind of do need like a policy in your business for what you're going to do. Because on the one hand, People want to join your thing. That's amazing. You want the money. You want to help them. But on the other hand, sometimes it is kind of like if your mom was like, oh, if you don't finish your plate, you're not getting dessert. And then she held that to you. But then your brother didn't eat dinner and got dessert. So like you have to balance of it's not fair sometimes to your other customers. In general, I say stick to your deadline. But recognize that life happens. Like I've seen emails where someone was in a car accident and like couldn't join or 
their electricity went out. So there's going to be things that come up. And I would just think of it ahead of time, what you want to do. Or maybe you let them join, but they don't get access to a certain bonus. Because I do think there's an amount of integrity. Like if you say that there's a deadline, you want to stick to it. Because otherwise you become that person where people are like, oh, well, they never do the deadline. So I don't need to buy their thing anyway. Like deadlines are very powerful for all of us. Yeah. I've been, I won't say names on this, obviously, but I've been in funnels before recently, like in, literally at the end of last year was one time this happened to me for courses where there's so much urgency with the countdown timers, this is closing and it's not closing. It was just a promotional period for it. And it's been, I emailed back once because I was like, this is very like not accurate. So it's just, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. And one thing, if anyone is in that boat of like, you're wanting to create urgency but you're not closing the product, which I do that with Booked Out Designer. I keep it open all the time, which I want us to talk about Evergreen versus like launch periods in a minute. But like I create other things that do expire during that promotional period. So you can honestly say, hey, you can buy the course anytime, but this thing is going to expire. I like that perspective. Okay. I want to ask you about the shorter courses situation. For people who do have courses that are really big. You know, I am someone who has one of those. What are ways that we could help people actually finish it and then still market the course well and not overwhelm people when it is a bigger course? I love this question because I think all of us feel a little bit of online course burnout lately. I think every business owner has purchased probably multiple courses and you did not finish it, which first of all, not finishing a course is fine. You probably got the value you needed out of it with the part that you did. Like I've been on the back end of so many courses. You don't always need to do every single lesson to get the results that you want. So right now, like I'm giving you permission to give up the shame of all of the courses you didn't finish. I have purchased courses and not finished them as well. So it's totally okay. But as a course creator, You do want to encourage and empower your students. Like we all want a little accountability coach and you cannot personally be there for every single student. That's totally unrealistic, but you can do things that help make the course easier to consume. And a lot of them are really easy, like making sure there's multiple ways to go through the content. So for example, I'm going to pick on Elizabeth's courses because I have been in both of them and seen them. So she has video lessons of everything. There's also handouts to go with the lessons, which some of the lessons, I have only looked at the handouts, Elizabeth, and I still got a lot of information out of it because I I have a newborn. I don't always have time. And then the other thing is I can listen to the lessons. So your courses are on Kajabi and they have an app where you can just listen to the lessons on the go. I do that. I've been walking my four month old baby girl around and I'll listen to podcast success blueprint. So having multiple ways for people to consume the same content is really helpful. People also learn in really different ways. Like there's some people who will only read the transcript of your course. And so I always tell people like, make sure you have a transcript in there because People use that and sometimes they don't watch the video. Yeah. Okay. And with transcripts, are platforms like Kajabi and Thrivecart and those, are they doing that automatically or is that something you'd have to upload yourself? Now they are. I think Kajabi just added an auto caption generator. In the past, you did usually have to create your own transcript. And that might still be something you want to do because you might say something in there where you link to something you mentioned and then that's really helpful for people and so they don't do that but most of them nowadays at least put captions on the videos which is a huge improvement you also want to think through accessibility stuff like there might be people joining your course who english for example is not their first language so if there's nothing in there to like help them read it or they can use that to get a translation or some people their course gets big enough that we end up translating it into like multiple different languages. But there's a lot of stuff to think through of how do I make it easier for people to go through the course? Okay, with that too, on going through courses, bigger courses, smaller courses, doesn't matter. I'm curious what you think just for someone making a course, ideal video links of the courses. And then with that too, do you think it's better to do slides only, to do face to camera, or to do slides with your face down in the corner? These are so specific. I love it. So video length, I usually tell people 10 to 15 minutes 
per video with the caveat that it's okay to have some lessons that are longer, especially if it's something in depth, it's like a screen flow recording of you literally doing the thing. Lessons where you're like, hey, I'm going to record my screen and I'm going to show you exactly how I do the thing that I am teaching you inside of the course are so powerful. So it's okay if that's longer. But in general, if your video for a lesson is longer than 15 minutes, I would take a look and just make sure everything in it needs to be in that lesson. Because when I say, hey, let's watch a 15 minute video, most people are like, okay, yeah, I have 15 minutes. Once you get to like 20 to 25, that's when all of our brains just shut off and are like, well, I don't have time for that. So let's just do none of it, which I think we are all guilty of not doing the thing because we're worried it's going to take too long. Yeah. And then the question on slides. So I've looked at research on this and then also seen in people's actual courses. What people think they should do is that they need a professional recording studio that they need to be on camera the entire time and have like this amazing set. Almost no one does that except for like super big entrepreneurs. And people don't really learn the best way like that either. It's really distracting to watch someone on camera, honestly. And it's really hard to be on camera as the course creator. So my preference is you come on camera to introduce yourself. You come on camera like every few modules, but you don't stay on camera. And then yes, you have slides, you speak over them because then people are paying attention to the content. And they also feel like they're not missing something if they look away which most people, if you survey your audience, they're going to be doing something else while they're listening to your course. Like they're washing the dishes or they're doing their bookkeeping because realistically multitasking is how most of us get things done. It's also way easier to record when you're not on camera. If you can make a course and you don't need makeup, you don't need to do your hair, you can record any time of the day. It doesn't matter. (laughs) But if you think that every time you have to look perfect to record a lesson, You're never going to finish your course. Like the amount of people I've told, like, just stop being on camera and that's how you're going to get your course done. Yes. And like the camera thing too, it helps your course feel more timeless because like besides the fact that we age, your hair might change and things like that to where it's like, oh, we see it now. You're like, wow, you look a lot different than you used to. Yeah. I love that. And okay. I keep asking follow-up questions on this. I want to hear some other unpopular opinions and go to some other things, but I'm curious your thoughts on putting, so you have the title of each lesson, right? Putting the length of the lesson in the title. Do you think that's a good idea? Or do you think it's better to let people like see what the lesson is and then click into it and decide that they want to watch regardless of the link? I think it's a fantastic idea. I always tell people to put the length of the lesson. So like how long the video is, it it doesn't have to be how long it's going to take to implement or anything like that. Just How long is the audio? I like to put that everywhere, like in the email that talks about it, sometimes on the sales page, if it makes sense. And you can also remind people that you can watch on like two times or three times speed. Sometimes people forget that and then they don't realize it's actually not going to take as long as they think. But like if you have an email reminding people, hey, go look at this module, I love to put like start with this video. It is 10 minutes long. You can do that while you're drinking a cup of coffee. Or if it's like 40 minutes long, tell them, like, make a really cozy cup of tea, dig in, stick with me, and we're going to get this done. And by the end of the hour, you're going to have learned the thing. Oh, that's good. That's good about the speeding it up. I forget about that myself. Yeah, that's great advice. Okay, so I want to ask you to maybe if you are able to share like, maybe two more course trends you're seeing that we can dive into, and then we're, we can talk about selling your course. I think accountability is like a really big one of people want some sort of support. And there's multiple ways to do this. You could have coaching calls. You could have like a live cohort where you're doing the lessons together. You could pair up people in your course and have accountability buddies. That's something that's really easy to do. So you're not meeting with anyone. You just have a way for them to like match up with each other. That could even just be a Facebook one Facebook thread in your Facebook group that's like, hey, do you need an accountability buddy? Post where you're at and what time zone you're in and then let people match up themselves. But anything like that, that feels like it's going to help people take action. One thing that we recently added to one of my clients courses, it's so simple, but it's been so effective. So we added silent co-working where 
You can come on Zoom. No one talks. That's one of the rules we set because we wanted it to be realistic for that it wasn't a training. Because as a course creator, a lot of people do monthly coaching calls, which is great and fantastic. They can be really exhausting to actually execute, though. Like if you have to show up and teach a bunch of people every month and then answer all of their questions, that's not always realistic. But if you say, I'm going to be on Zoom for an hour, I'm not going to say anything, we're just going to play music, and all we're going to do is work on the course, or all we're going to do is work on thinking through the name of your podcast, for example, which if you say something really specific, that's really valuable to people, and you aren't doing anything. You're just like being their study buddy, and people love that. Oh, I get, yeah, I get why that seems like something that would add a lot of value. You're right. Like, and as someone who does coaching in courses, it is like a lot to do every month. It's always really fulfilling for me, but then I am like, I get why it can feel like a lot to handle. I love the just Zoom call thing. So with that though, would you say if we were to do like a co-working Zoom call, should it be the lead course creator on it? Or do you think it's appropriate for a team member of theirs to lead it? Or is it like, does it need to be you? I think it's totally appropriate for it to be a team member. And that has worked great. Sometimes that even works better because sometimes your team members are like a little more in the thick of it. Like as the course creator, you might not remember where every lesson is, but the whoever is responding to your customer service emails about your course probably off the top of their head knows like where that template you mentioned is or where something else is. It's also kind of cool and fun behind the scenes to see someone else's team. Like I've done that for some clients where I led the co-working session and people just thought it was like fun and different. So either way, again, it's not always sustainable as a course creator to be the one. It's more important to create valuable ways to support your students. And it's okay if you have like, we can call it an assistant teacher or whatever who steps in and also helps support them. Yeah. And that is like, like you're saying the accountability, it also even goes back to what we were saying about people feeling like course overwhelm of like, this can be something that helps them feel like they're going to get through it, but then also like actually get through it because they're thinking about it more versus just buying it and being like, hoping that the purchase like makes everything work for them. Oh, is there another trend you're seeing besides those two? Another one. And this has always kind of been a thing, but it's becoming more and more. And I think this is the thing that makes people buy is having some sort of done for you type of template thing. So something that is like two clicks of a button and they can use it. So think of any software that's related to your course. So maybe if you were a photographer, you have like a Dubsado invoice proposal that comes with your course. So that way people are learning the thing, but then they actually have something tangible to go use and implement. A lot of the times when I do why did you buy surveys, which are so powerful. If you have a course, go ask your students why they bought. Often they will say something weirdly specific, like (laughs) one line on the sales page or one bonus. But a lot of them will say like the Canva templates that came with the course pushed me over the edge or the Dubsado proposal or the scripts that you use to pitch potential sponsors. Like anything like that is so valuable to people. Yeah. And I agree with that. And I've had that happen for me, like you're saying of like it being like a few different templates in the course or other types of resources that are not specifically templates that made people decide to buy. I love what you said about the why you bought survey. I'm curious, do you mean like sending that immediately after the launch week to everyone? Or is this a thing later that you're asking when you're asking your students for like a full testimonial? Usually it is later when you're doing a full testimonial. Sometimes we'll have like a little onboarding survey. And I would keep that short because the more you make people do before they can consume your content, the more opportunity you have to overwhelm them, they'll shut down. They won't do your course and then they'll be sad about it without like ever even seeing that it could have helped them. So you could ask them like maybe on the welcome email. It's like, hey, thank you for joining. Will you reply one, two, or three, and then list out the options? Like one, you bought because you saw the timer on the page. Two, you purchased because of this bonus. Three, you just really like me as a person. But you want to make it easy. So like either have them click the link or literally just reply Mm -hmm. one, two, three. So that's one way you can do it immediately. Typically, though, I ask more in depth about 90 days out as you're asking about their course experience. As you said, you're getting testimonials, which is huge. You should do that. 
And then also you're just being a good course creator and finding out what they like and what they don't like. And your students will tell you how to make your course better. They often will tell you really good bonus ideas as well that then you can go sell. Yes. You, I feel like you've literally done that for me, like the bonus ideas thing where I'm like, oh yeah, that's a really good idea. I should do that. Are you a fan of sending the survey to the people who were on your launch list or maybe on the wait list or had expressed interest, they had attended a webinar, but didn't buy? And do you have any advice on doing that if you are into that? <laughs> I am into that, though sometimes it extends like your launch period. So be careful you're not annoying people. If it's a shorter launch, I think it's better and goes over a little better of, hey, can you fill out the survey? If you did a 10-day launch and then you have a downsell and then you ask them to fill out the survey and then maybe there's something else, like people honestly kind of get annoyed. So at the very least, maybe give them an option, like do the thing where at the top of your email, like, hey, this is still about my course. I hope this isn't bothering you. If you don't want to hear about this anymore, click here. You'll see a cute gif of a dog and we'll remove you from this section of the list. Like give people the option to choose their own adventure. But in general, I do think it's helpful to ask, why did you not buy? Maybe don't do it on every launch, but it is really powerful data, though. Most of the time, people say two things. They say they don't have the money right now, or they didn't have time. People always say the time thing. That's good to know. Yeah. And I've never done those surveys personally, but I've been thinking about it. And I meant to recently and just never got around to it. I I get what you're saying, though, about how it could annoy people. You also need to make sure you're sending it to the right people. Like your whole email list would not need that because your whole email list was probably not interested in the course to begin with. Yeah, that's awesome advice, Mara. Okay. So let's talk, we've made the course, let's say, and we're talking about selling it. I'm so curious your thoughts on this, but you know, we have the option of like a launch model where there's cart open, cart close period. That's what you were talking about of like, it might be five days, it might be 14 days and crazy stuff like that. Or an evergreen model where the course is just always for sale. Uh, I guess I, my first question would be like, which one do you think leads to more sales? Like over time, generally speaking, and which one do you prefer and see the best results with? So in general, I think deadlines are very helpful and live launches. So I'm talking where there's like a cart open, you can't join anytime. They seem to perform better. Now that is not, I have seen both sides of the coin. I have seen people who only do live launches. They don't like, if you want to join your course and you're not in the right season, too bad. You can't join. They build up a bunch of hype for their course. It works great. I have also seen people who do only evergreen because live launching totally stresses them out. And they also make very good money. Like we're talking six figures to a million dollars. So whatever you want to do is totally okay. I think the reason live launches seem to do better is a lot of people who are on evergreen don't remember how to talk about their course. Like it feels weird to keep talking about your course. It feels braggy. It feels I don't know, like you're getting too big for your shoes, but people in your audience like genuinely do not always know about your course. I've seen people who they're like, Mara, my course is not selling. It's on Evergreen. I go to their website and I'm like, what is your course? I don't see anything about it on social media. I don't see a link at the top of your website. And then they're like, oh, well, it's mentioned one time in the welcome email. And I'm like, why did you think anyone was going to buy based off of that? So both work. If you're on Evergreen, I just think be very mindful that novelty is huge. Like fun, new, exciting things. Our brains love that. So if you're on Evergreen, do things like add new bonuses, talk about your course once in a while. Like even if it's just you taking a photo because you're updating a lesson in your course or you're about to go on a coaching call, like keep talking about your course so that people know it's still a thing. You didn't go out of business. It didn't shut down. It's still very successful and they can join at any time. Yeah, that's yeah. Working on your course, like you're saying, coaching calls, updates is an opportunity or you get feedback from a student, an opportunity to just like do another post about it. When it is on Evergreen. But yeah, that's a common Evergreen problem I see as well of like, you just forget to talk about it or you don't have funnels set up that allow it to sell more, quote unquote, on Evergreen. The thing I'm I'm curious what you think about this. So right now, just everyone knows about my courses. I have Booked Out Designer, which is on Evergreen. And it has been like that and has made multiple six figures that way. And even without ads, which I did a whole episode on Mars podcast talking about Booked Out Designer, which is going to air on this podcast in a few weeks. So that's fun. 
But anyway, I did that. I did Booked Out Designer that way. I'm planning to bring Podcast Success Blueprint Evergreen as well, because that's just been like what I feel like has worked well in my life. But also, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. I know that like my specific week that I could launch something or that I'm going to do a course promotion might not be when the person's starting their podcast, might not be when they're ready to like really go all in on their design business. So I don't want them to go see a wait list, see it's not opening for three months and just buy someone else's course. So like if you are doing the launch model, how do you solve that problem of people just like going to someone else? This is a huge thing you have to think through because it does matter what your course is about. And you don't want to have a course like Elizabeth, your course is amazing for website designers about how to get booked out. You wouldn't want to have a website designer find your course and then they're like, oh, I can't join. Well, I guess I'm going to go join someone else's course. Like that's not what you want to happen. So I do think it's important to think through how are people going to want to be finding your course? Is it something people are always starting and learning, which a lot of courses are? Or is it something that you really only do one time? Like if your course was about how to set New Year's goals, totally makes Mm -hmm. sense that that would launch in December. And then close because a lot of people in June like aren't specifically thinking about resolutions. If you are on the live launch model, something you can do is create really good opt-ins. So make sure you have ways to help people for free that when they find you, you have enough content that'll help them. You have a podcast, you have an ebook or something free, and then it helps them enough to get to the point where they can wait for your course. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, like nurturing them along the way with it. Yeah, that's awesome. And I I guess another kind of question that goes along with this, but like, what are some mistakes you see people making, whether they're evergreen or launch model, but when it comes to selling their courses, I know you just said one mistake would be like, if it's on evergreen, you just never actually talk about it. What are some other mistakes you see? A big live launch mistake that I see all the time is people change what they're doing to launch when they're launching. So you'll be in the middle of a launch, you wrote all your emails, right? You have them scheduled. And then there's this crazy thing that happens where at night, your brain is going to go crazy. And it's going to tell you to like change the price of your course to add a new bonus to rewrite all of your emails. And I see so many people fall into this trap. And then what happens is they make this crazy Frankenstein launch that starts to like not make sense because you added a new bonus, or you said something weird in the email that didn't make sense, and you wrote it at like 12am, like don't (laughs) fall into the launch craziness. I think it's better to do your plan. And then like any fancy stuff you want to do, put it on your shiny object list for the next launch, and you can try it. But I see so many people who mess with their launch during the launch. And then they're like, well, no one bought. And I'm like, well, I've seen people change the name of their course in the middle of the launch, which is just wild, right? Like, how do people know what they're buying? I've also seen people who they'll just make up a bonus and email it out, which if you think of a bonus and it is genuinely helpful to your audience, add it. That is totally okay. But don't just like be making up stuff at 5 p.m. at night and then your team is mad behind the scenes because they got some random email about something that they didn't know was going to exist. But yeah, that constant tweaking... I've seen people also extend the cart like five times. It's okay to let your cart close. Take the lessons that you need to take from the launch and try again, which every single person, it doesn't feel this way, but I'm going to tell you as someone who has launched so many courses, the first launch is kind of painful. I think you, Elizabeth, you had like brand templates or something way, way long ago that you said failed, which is like totally normal that five people join or like two people buy, I think every course creator has some story at some point in their career. So do not be intimidated by that because having a course is about exponential growth of like maybe five people join it and then 10 people join it and then 25 people join it and then 50 people. And like it compounds over time. And it's really hard to see that when you're in the beginning of the course creation process. Yeah, that's so many good reminders. And yes, I had a product that sold zero when I first tried to make my first product before I sold templates. So yeah, sometimes you only see people's version of launching their course that looks like, oh, everyone who ever could have bought, bought. But that's typically, yeah, there's typically a story where that's more of the case. When someone is having a launch that let's say halfway through it, they're like, no one's buying, it's going poorly. 
what are some ways that you could like turn a launch around or even set expectations before a launch so that you're not like on that like hamster wheel of disappointment, excitement, no one's buying this person bought, you know, that whole like franticness that people can feel. It is a total hamster wheel, by the way, like launching is kind of crazy, which is why evergreen is a thing because live launching will drive some people absolutely crazy. If that's your personality type, I'm giving you permission. You do not ever need to live launch. You can, you can still be (laughs) successful. But if you are launching and you're like, okay, we're not seeing sales, we need to do some sort of pivot. I like to think through like, what are small changes you can make? So could you add something around money? Like, could you add a different type of payment plan? That's usually something that's really easy to tweak and change, like change your sales page, add a different payment plan. Like I've even seen people who had a three pay option and then a pay in full. And then we switched it to, do you want to do a two payment option? And people took advantage of that because the three pay felt like too much of a commitment to some people, but the two pay didn't. So that's something that's super easy that you can tweak. Another thing you can do, and this depends on the size of your list because this might get unsustainable, but go back to basics. Can you look at who clicked on your sales page, which it's great in your emails if you can tag those people. That's really helpful data to have down the road of, did this person click on the sales page? And then can you just like record them a really short Loom video that's like, hey, Elizabeth, I noticed you clicked. I've got some extra time after dinner. I just wanted to see if you had any questions. Like literally a 30 second video. You don't even have to do that to everyone. You could do that to like five people that you randomly picked off of your sales page clickers list. And first of all, it's really powerful because people are like, oh, I, like she's a real person. She's paying attention to me. And then whatever they say, if they do ask a question, it might be really helpful. They might tell you, you know, I was going to buy, but then I clicked the checkout button and it was like kind of weird. And I wasn't sure if this was like a real checkout. And so then, you know, oh, maybe I need to add some logos of PayPal and Stripe so people get I'm not a scammer or Maybe my like checkout page is really confusing, or maybe I need to add like what the refund policy is and make that super clear. Because that's one I see a lot where people are on the fence and they're like, well, I want to try it, but you didn't say if I get a refund if I don't like it. Like you didn't say anything about refund. So little tweaks like that. So do not blow up your entire launch, but do try to figure out where people are having a hesitation. And if you have extra time and you're pulling your hair out, do something novel and crazy. You can even just like get on Instagram and be like, I'm doing an AMA, anything about my course or life, ask me. And then you can just like ask questions and be a real human to people. Those, I feel like we'll need to rewind everything you just said, because that was all like brilliant ideas, especially the like clicking sales page people uh, from your emails. So I want to share something like something I've done almost every promotional period of my business, whether it's like, a promo week for an evergreen course or an actual launch, even template sales, I have an automated thing in ConvertKit where I'm tagging people when they are clicking the buttons that are leading to the sales page in the email. And they all go under a tag in ConvertKit that's like clicked sales page during podcast success blue launch, something along like that. And then at, towards the end of the sale, when it's a lot of people, I've done it where I'm writing an email to all those people that's saying like, hey, I noticed you clicked on the sales page. <laughs> And the course closes tomorrow. And I'm curious if you have any questions. So it feels more personalized, but I'm still doing it through ConvertKit. But then I have also done and literally did this. I'm I'm coming fresh off of a launch as we're recording this. But like with my recent podcast success blueprint launch, there were a few people like I'm literally looking at your name. I'm looking at what you've been clicking on. I copy and paste their email over to my email system and email them directly just saying like, hey, you were on the wait list or like, I noticed you're clicking stuff like, what can I help with and have made sales that way just through opening the conversation. And you get to hear hesitations that they may have never shared if you had not emailed them directly. So you're not too big of a deal or too big of a launch or too many people to like do stuff like that. Like I've literally been like, what? I'm always going to do that. Like it works, it's helpful. And you get so much good feedback too from people who don't buy by doing that. Yeah, but people forget that you can still use like small launch strategies as your course grows. Like it is totally okay. And if you don't have time to do that for all of your sales page clickers, like I said, just like randomly generate a name, randomly generate a number and then pick someone. But it's amazing the data you get 
Um, and people do talk also. Like, I always find that stuff comes back to you of maybe they join your course and then like two years down the road, they are like your biggest champion because they are like, oh my gosh, Elizabeth personally emailed me. I was on the fence. I wasn't going to join the course. And then she reached out. I joined. It's amazing. Like now I've had two years of success, which it's really powerful as your course grows. Like courses are kind of like babies of they, <laughs> they grow up and it's really cool when your course is like two to four years old of you start to get people who like actually implemented every single thing and are now really successful. And it like is so cool as a course creator to make a course, someone joins your course, they like, for example, did not have a podcast. And then they go and do the thing and they have a podcast and they get to share your name. Like you want more students like that in your course. Yeah. And you're right. That personalized touch adds a lot and it's a lot easier than it seems i think in theory and yeah i think a lot of people feel like you know, could also be an instagram dm that you're doing that with so i have another question for you you mentioned the refund policy concept of people just like not they're wanting to buy but they don't know that there's a refund policy i i have our thoughts on this i want to hear your thoughts though how do we use the refund policy as a selling point for the course if we do have a strong refund policy Okay, so first of all, you want to think through, are you giving refunds or not? In general, for a course, I think having a refund period, which personally, usually 14 days is the sweet spot. I say that with a lot of caveats. I might tell you something totally different based off of your course. I've seen a lot of people who do like three days that usually is too short and creates a bunch of customer service where people are like, I didn't have time to even log in and you gave me this three day and it feels kind of like mean if you then have to be like, well, the refund is three days and we're sticking to it. 14 days is like the sweet spot where if they never logged in, they were probably were not going to. And then I, I see a lot of people that do a month, I think, because they want people to have a lot of time to consume the course and maybe also forget about the refund policy, like in all honesty. And a month sometimes is really long. So 14 days somewhere in there, I find is very helpful. And let people know, like, this is a trial run, you can use this. I do think it's important to think through when someone asks you for a refund, are you going to make them jump through any hoops? I don't know if you've ever been a part of a course where like, I I've seen the back end of this, and I've called some people out of like, you cannot have people ask for a refund, then they have to submit all of this homework, then they have to record you a Loom video about why they don't like the course. Like, that's, why? Yeah, that's, that's completely wild. But some people do that because having people ask for a refund, which if you have an online course, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm telling you, if it hasn't happened already, it's going to happen. And most likely, it will have nothing to do with you of just it wasn't the right time for the person. They didn't have time to log in. They're stressed about money. Like, it is often not about you. It's going to happen. Don't freak out about it. But are you going to be weird and make them jump through a lot of hoops? Because I think it's very important to be very clear what the refund policy is. So is it truly a no questions asked refund policy? Or is it like, you're going to have to do like, this does work well for people of saying as long as you have watched all of module one, so as long as we can see that you watch the video, you're good. That's all you have to do. So just think through what you feel comfortable with. And it's okay to tell people they can have a refund for any reason. And then when they do ask for the refund, just say, absolutely. I am more than happy to give you the refund. I'm so sorry it wasn't a good fit. Can you just tell me a little more about what your goals in joining were? And I'm just curious. And sometimes you responding as a real person or someone on your team, by the way, is all they need. Or they might say, well, I joined your course. And then there wasn't a lesson about how to name your podcast, which I'm using that as an example, because I know there's a lesson in Elizabeth's podcast course about how to name your podcast. So sometimes they'll say, I couldn't find the lesson. You're like, oh my gosh, the link is right here. And they're like, oh, I don't need a refund anymore. I just missed where it was. Yeah. Oh, that's all such great advice. And when you, when you said that, like, you will get a refund request at some point. I always like to tell people with digital products in general that like, if you never get a refund request, it's because you're not reaching enough people who are actually willing to take the risk and buy. So like, it's actually a negative thing. If you never, if you have a lot of sales and you've never gotten a refund request, it means you're probably not making as much sales as you could potentially. Yeah, that's, that's helpful though. And yeah, refund policy stuff is so complex. I've had to update and change mine and refine it many times for book.designer specifically, because it's like trying to figure out 
the balance of like what like because I don't do a no questions asked situation but I am like it's very easy if you were like legitimately wanting a refund and not liking the course to not get it do you think it's okay to do I know you said no no jumping through hoops right like I, yeah no loom videos and submitting homework but do you think it's okay to have people fill out a form so that you can streamline the refund request process or would you say that that is also like not a good idea Oh, a form is 100% the way to go because it does streamline the refund process. So what we're talking about here is like if someone requests a refund, either there's a way inside of the course or when they email customer service, they just fill out a form that asks a few questions of like what their name is, what their experience was, because that data is really helpful. So I do think ask questions. I've just seen people make it so challenging to get a refund. Like they basically made it impossible. And then it it made the person really mad, which something about being a business owner, sometimes the best answer is to let someone go. (laughs) Like sometimes they want a refund. If they stay in your world, they're going to make your life like even harder. So even if you have a refund policy as a business owner, there's always going to be weird situations that question the bounds of that refund policy of there's like some crazy extreme situation happening or there's I don't there's so much about refunds though where you have to find the right boundaries that you want to set because there's also times where people will ask you for crazy things they'll be in your course for two years they'll give you a bunch of testimonials and then they'll ask for a refund I've seen that happen to people and we're just like what you're literally in our testimonial folder saying that you loved this course and that you got great results and now you expect a refund two years later. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's a good example of like, you know, they're clearly out of the bounds, but you're right that sometimes it's better just to let people go because by letting them go, you're creating like potentially still a good experience for them where they might buy from you again. But if you like hold someone Mm -hmm. hostage in your course or membership, they're going to tell all their friends that that happened. Like there are some people who I'm aware of who do like courses and memberships, who it's like, it's a known thing that you can't get out of it. Like you have to keep paying no matter what. And, and people get mad about that and they talk and that's, yeah. And you want that person to have a good experience with you, even if it means that they're not staying in your course. So yeah, that's awesome. You have so much great advice. Okay. So I have, I have a few other questions. I want to ask you some rapid fire ones, but also real quick, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this because I feel like I want to just ask you all the course questions, but you're in Book Designer and Podcast Success Blueprint, but Podcast Success Blueprint more recently. And you have, I, I seriously, I'm not kidding. I love your podcast. I was listening to it earlier today. It's called Create a Better Course. Um, you launched it, I guess, in 2013, right? Or was it, it was 2013, right? It was the so last year. So it's right on about to turn one year old. Okay. Yeah. So and yeah, your, and your podcast does awesome. I I mean, yeah, I'd love to talk to you even more about it. But like, what made you decide with having your podcast to join Podcast Success Blueprint? So yes, I already had a podcast. If Elizabeth had a course about how to start a podcast, when I launched my podcast, I would have purchased it. But you didn't have it quite yet. You had not birthed that like online course baby yet. But there are quite a few podcast courses, right? And I wanted to grow my podcast because truly it has been such an amazing thing for my business, which... I didn't realize like all of the benefits of having a podcast that go beyond just like the clout of having a podcast, but people listen to you, they connect with you. I have had so many people that are like, oh my gosh, you're like so fun to talk to, which is part of one of the reasons I started a podcast was I had a past client tell me that she was referred to me multiple times, but she just like didn't know. She would go to my website. It had all of these great blog posts about like, online course tech, which I have some like really nerdy techie blog posts about like Kajabi and Thrivecart and stuff. And so she was on the fence and there wasn't like anywhere you could hear me talk. We had a discovery call and she was like, wait, you're so nice and friendly. Like you need, you need a podcast so people know about that. And so that's been huge for my business. So people just like no, I'm a real human, but there are a lot of podcast courses. Pretty much all of them are about how to launch your podcast and then they just stop. That's it. They're like, you got it live and there's nothing more. Your course is not like that at all. It has all of the launching stuff, which is super helpful. I've listened to some of it and I'm like, I should have done some of it that way back before, but it's okay. But I really wanted something that was like, this is a long-term decision. I'm going to have my podcast for a long-term. We're in a committed relationship here. And your course walks through like 
all of the kind of messy stuff later on of like, how do you schedule interviews? How do you deal with the 10 million tasks that come with having a podcast of like the social media, the email, you have to write all of the graphics and all of that is in the course, which I already told you guys, I have a four month old. I do not have time to figure this out on my own. So I just wanted a course that I could basically copy and paste, which I completely bootlegged your garage band settings, by the way, out of your course of like, I watched the video about how to record. I just did literally what you said, recorded it. And then the next, like the next episode, I did that. Someone actually messaged me and they were like, oh, your audio like sounds a little bit better. Well, it wasn't bad before, but I was so impressed that someone noticed. They were like, it was like clearer this time. Did you get a new microphone? And I was like, Nope, did not get a new microphone, just did the right settings. I love that. That's so fun, too, that someone noticed. And yes, like the settings matter as much. I think we have the same mic, too, maybe. Do we? Audio Technica mic? Yeah, we do. Yes, the Audio Technic, it's great, and it is so affordable. So if you think you need a $200 microphone, you really do not. (laughs) You can do a $50 mic, yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. I have loved watching you take on that different type of content in your business. I think it is such a good fit for you. And your show really is fun to listen to. And I've learned a lot from it. And particularly, I loved your Black Friday episodes last year, which I know I've already told you that. But like those, she did a Black Friday predict, it was like trends to try kind of thing, predictions. It was really good. Um, Okay, awesome. So I also wanted to ask you, let's do some rapid fire actually. And we'll kind of close out. What is an unpopular opinion you have about the online course industry? So I have a lot, but one that came to mind is expiring courses. I don't really like them. I personally like lifetime access, but there are people out there who really push that when you have a course, you need to give people like three months to do it, six months to do it, and then their access expires and then they need to rebuy it. And people say that this pushes people to have more accountability, to finish the course. Yeah, in some ways. Also, it creates like a bunch of customer service headache to deal with people who, because a lot of people buy a course and they just don't have time to do the thing right when they buy. Like when I bought Podcast Success Blueprint, I think I was like 39 weeks pregnant the first time you launched it. So I did not watch a lot of lessons then. But over Christmas, I went and I binged a bunch of stuff. So I think it's totally normal that when people buy your course, they're not going to do all of the things right away. I don't. I think expiring access is kind of overhyped. A lot of people would be mad that I said that, though, because a lot of people think yeah. it's like the thing of your course should always like expire and you shouldn't have lifetime access. Well, that's also talking again about marketing your course. That's something worth talking about more than we think. I actually experienced that in the recent podcast success blueprint launch. I got a few different people asking me if they have lifetime access and I didn't even think to talk about that because they do. But I'm like, I just like assumed people knew that. And that actually gave me some good content to be like, oh yeah, I need to mention that like, like you're saying more of like, you're not actually trying to like take it right now. You still have access. Yeah. I've seen the expiring course thing, particularly with stuff where there's a risk of people just sharing it. So like, Mm -hmm. I've bought a lot of pregnancy and birth type courses or newborn courses. And those often have an expiration because they're wanting you to not just like share it with all your mom friends, but then they will give you access without making you rebuy it. Cause I have reached out again. Like, Hey, I'm about to have another baby. Can I have access again? So yeah, I totally agree with you that that can be like unsightly and not nice and kind of confusing to people in customer service headache. Yeah. Okay. So another rapid fire question for you. Not related to courses, but also related to marketing and selling. But you write really good email subject lines. And I've heard you say that you, I think you showed this on Instagram, maybe that you like come up with a whole bunch of ideas for the subject line and then you nail it down to one for your like weekly emails. And I feel like your subject lines are like some of the best I see ever. And I respond to your emails, but like, this is also a really good email. Like, it's just the subject line, though, you do a really great job on specifically. So what is a tip if you could share one for people on like how they could write better subject lines for their business? Okay, so I'm going to give one that's really actionable because sometimes with subject lines, people say something that's like confusing or more abstract. They're like, just think about what you would want to read. Okay, something I actually do is when I am writing the email and I send myself a test email, I rapid fire send myself at least three test emails. All of them are different subject lines. So I change like, 
maybe what word is capitalized. I change the emoji. Sometimes I say something totally different. Then I go look in my super ridiculously crowded inbox and I see which one of those three I actually noticed first. And that's been really helpful because seeing your email in ConvertKit or ActiveCampaign is totally different than the crowded inbox. So I look and I see, oh, my eye was drawn to that really weird subject line where I like had four dot dot dots and then used, I don't know, like an exploding head emoji or something. Yeah. Oh, that's such a great idea. Because you're right, it is different when you see it alongside other things. How do you come up with as many ideas as you do for your subject lines? I have a folder in my Gmail. And when I open an email, I move it to that folder. So I have a folder of just like, interesting things I open. So I don't put in there like when my bank emails me and I open it because I want to know what they said, but like interesting subject lines that made me click. So I have a folder that's like over 10 years old at this point of just a whole bunch of ideas. So I look in there a lot. If I think of something, I will write it down. Another weird thing I do is sometimes I think about what I wish someone else's subject line would be. Like, I love reading your emails too, Elizabeth. So like, if you took that as an example of like, what do I wish you would write an email about? And then what would the subject line be? Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's really good. And I love the folder idea. That could even be a folder like both about subject lines and like, this is an email that did a really great thing that made me want to buy or made me interested. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, I don't want to take more of your time, but I want you to tell everyone where they can find you, how they can work with you about your templates and all that kind of good stuff. Yes. So probably the best spot is to subscribe to my podcast. It's called Create a Better Course. I have a ton of episodes about online course stuff. And I also have done a bunch of episodes about running a business as a service provider who sets up online courses for people. So I do like a bunch of money episodes, like income reports. And then I've been talking a lot about being a new mom because that's a whole new thing for me this year of how do I have a business and also have a tiny baby who's super adorable, but wants all of my time. You can also just go to my website, marakaseric.com. My last name is impossible to pronounce, thanks to my husband, but I have embraced it. And it's actually really great for SEO. So if you have a weird last name, just launch your business. It'll be amazing on Google. Everyone will be able to find you. <laughs> that is such a good tip. I've laughed. You might have heard me share this before, Mara, but like a common, if you look, if I look at my like Google console analytics, one of the most common searches that leads to my website is Elizabeth Mick Gravy. And it's like, it's just, but that's so, that might still come up for that. So that's good. But yes, I can get that on that. Yeah. Your, your last name is a little tougher than mine though. Yes. So everyone go listen to your podcast, your website, all of those things. Yeah. Thank you, Mara, so much. I feel like I learned a lot. I got some great like insights for my courses talking to you and I'm sure it listeners did as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. I hope you got so much value from this episode. If you're a fellow podcaster or you hope to start a podcast in the near future, then you need to check out my program, Podcast Success Blueprint. This course is truly podcasting from A to Z. I cover all the getting started steps like naming your show, creating intros and outros, cover art design, and all things podcast tech. And that's where most podcast courses stop. But Podcast Success Blueprint is literally just getting started at that point. You'll go on to learn things like how to create successful solo episodes and interview episodes, how to market your podcast and grow your listeners, how to create streamlined systems so that your podcast does not take over your life, how to make real money from your show. Yes, real money from your podcast, one of my absolute favorite modules. And we even dive into things like guesting on other podcasts to grow your business and hiring a team to help you manage your show. Yes, it is beyond the basics and I'm teaching you everything you need to know to grow a successful show that is the top of funnel marketing strategy for your business. Head to elizabethmccravey.com slash PSB, short for Podcast Success Blueprint, to get all the details and join this incredible program. I hope I can help you in this program as you build your podcast and market your business. All right, that's it, friends. I cannot wait to connect with you again next week. Bye for now.